to this edition of the STED Talks, in case you don't know what the acronym stands for, Spine Technology Education and Discussion, Discovery, Debate, etc. Today's uh, featured speaker is Mr. Henry Turner, Mr. because in the uh, British world, a surgeon is or prefers to be called and referred to as a Mr. and not as a doctor. Uh, that goes back to the days of uh, surgeons as barbers on the battlefield. But uh, Mr. Henry Turner is going to join us uh, from London, UK, and he's very passionate about understanding and exploring the intersections of lung function and uh, major spine deformity surgery. And he's written a very nice thesis thesis project on this, and he's also, I think, joined by his mentor, Mr. Patrick Kiley from uh, Dublin, Ireland. I'm trying to do an Irish broker. I'm not very good at that. So this is a, um, a really cool occasion, and we've run across his master's thesis uh, recently and invited him to speak, and he's uh, been at a previous presentation, did a very cool job on this, so we thought we'd bring him back to feature that to a larger and different audience. So thank you all for joining us this morning, and sorry that it's still under the restrictions of a pandemic. Uh, we still have a restricted audience here in place, and to be assured, all of us are following all applicable rules. It's a great pleasure to um, say goodbye to, but with uh, with a crying eye, that is, to our wonderful uh, research fellow, uh, Pericles Godolphias. Do you mind just coming up and showing your face to the screen? Perry has been here for a year in Germany. Any words you'd like to say? Well, first of all, it was a great uh, experience being here and uh, working with such a great team together on so many research projects. And um, yeah, I wish everybody could do this once. Um, and I think I will, I, I learned a lot and uh, I will continue doing these things uh, the way we did them over here in Germany. Thank you, Perry. I can't get too close to you, but uh, he's done some outstanding work and he's going to join us from Germany when these projects are completed. Uh, he's, for instance, done a beautiful job mapping the lumbar plexus out of a routine MRI scan. This is a very cool new application and we're going to talk about that perhaps later, but uh, we very much hope you'll join us from Germany. He's done a number of other uh, very interesting things that will lead him on the path of becoming a full professor in Germany. So he'll have uh, 20 plus papers probably coming out of his time here. Uh, we have a newcomer also. Do you want to come up front here quickly? Uh, Dr. Jonathan Plumer, tell us a little bit about who you are so that the regulars will recognize you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan Plummer. I'm a trauma and orthopedic surgeon from uh, Germany. So uh, I'm the successor of uh, Perry, and I'm also working for the BG uh, University Hospital in, in uh, Bochum, Germany. So um, I hope I have such a good time like Perry. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to recognize, thank you, Jonathan. I want to recognize the extraordinary personal efforts of our fellows in these times of a pandemic. Uh, they have uh, brought, in their, uh, brought their spouses. Uh, one of them had a baby here. The other one is going to have a baby. So on the spouses is a tremendous additional burden. So I, we really appreciate you making this extra effort in your home institution at the University of Bochum and the Big E Clinic uh, for having made the administrative pathway clear towards this kind of ongoing extraordinary extraordinary relationship. We value it greatly. As always, we start with some uh, cases to kind of uh, look at some current and ongoing concerns and problems. And I'll invite Dr. Jerry Robinson to maybe take the lead. Uh, this is a case that has the intersection of uh, trauma care and pulmonary function and uh, fracture specific problems for a certain spine problem, all inherent and combined in one. Jerry, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jerry Robinson. I'm from Akron, Ohio. I trained at Crystal Clinic in Summa Health, and I'm the orthopedic spine fellow here at Swedish. Okay, slides are up. So the first case is a 78 year old male uh, was an intoxicated ground level fall onto their back. They complained of mid back pain, but no leg pain. Uh, they did have pain with movement in the bed, uh, mostly with twisting and rotation or any kind of flexion or extension. They deny any numbness or tingling. <clears throat> of note, they do have a past medical history significant for type two diabetes and alcoholism, as well as a previous T10 to 12 laminectomy in the distant past. Uh, it's unclear what exact pathology that was treating at the time. 
He was uh, five out of five in his bilateral lowers on exam with normal sensation and deep tendon reflexes, but he did have pain with any type of movement in his bed. Here you can see <clears throat> his T1112 AO type B3 fracture hyperextension injury with his previous T10 to 12 laminectomy. And you can see there's some kind of uh, ankylosing disorder here uh, in the upper and uh, lower thoracic, it looks more like dish, but down here in the lumbar, you can see you have an ankylosed lumbar spine on his CT. He did not have fused uh, SI joints, uh, but they were arthritic. And you can see that there's an L12 and L45 non-fused segment, and there's an MRI for completeness sake. So before we go much further, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Keeley, Patrick uh, in Dublin. Can you hear us? Yeah. Good morning. Hi, I know you mainly deal with pediatric cases, but uh, we have, or we seem to have, and we've published on this before, a scourge of ankylosing spine disorders. I know you're on the other end, the younger end of the spectrum, but is this something that you have uh, seen to be a problem in terms of spine care in Ireland? Absolutely. Um, it's very, in the emergency setting, often very uh, underappreciated. The potentials for fractures and pseudarthrosis um, it's a, a, nearly always a, a story of a kind of missed injury in my experience. Um, but of course, I don't see that. So if that was more in my adult practice, but that would be so typical, you know, with this mechanical pain symptoms that no one's um, potentially switched on or a few are switched on to the, to the potential of this. Um, it's a real, a real challenging scenario. Yeah, no, I mean, this has become a major problem. One thing that I've had as a gripe for a long time is not just that it's under-recognized, but that we don't do a good job differentiating these various injuries because there are some differences uh, that are noteworthy between them, not just uh, kind of uh, daintily. One big factor is, uh, obviously, Jerry, just go through the main three uh, ankylosing disorders outside of surgical ankylosis. Yeah, so um, ankylosing spondylitis being, uh, like here you can see in the lumbar spine, usually starts at a younger age with back pain, uh, sacroiliitis, then you have DISH, usually on one side of the spine. What does DISH stand for? <clears throat> Diffuse idiopathic hyper... Skeletal. Or skeletal hyperostosis. Basically means the bone overgrows. And then the third one is... It's less well known. There's not a catchy acronym. We tried to publish it a couple of years ago. Oh, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, uh, end stage arthropathy or hypertrophic arthropathy, oh, EHA. Okay. E -H -A. Um, but so that's not been that well accepted. But it's basically gross overgrowth of uh, uh, spine arthropathy, spondylosis that leads to a <laughs> functional ankylosis. All right, so here we have um, what, Jerry? Is this a more DISH, a disseminated idiopathic hyperostosis or an ankylosing spondylitis problem? Like I said earlier, in, on, in the thoracic spine, you can see these flowing uh, osteophytes on the anterior uh, rim of the uh, vertebral body, so it seems like more like a DISH syndrome, but he does have complete ankylosis at multiple levels in his lumbar spine. His uh, sacroiliac joint is not fused on his CT scan, so it's kind of ambiguous in between. He does not carry a formal diagnosis of AS or DISH, but I would say that he meets uh, criteria for at least DISH. I, I think he would need more testing for AS. Um, I really want to echo what Dr. Mark Dekutowski, a long-term supporter and uh, colleague and friend uh, and co-author on several papers, has pointed out. Um, uh, thank you for pointing out how important it is to recognize this, Mark. Um, I want to reflect on what he just said. Uh, the general medical community, emergency physicians, radiologists, and uh, prior spine community, again, has to be far more eloquent and knowledgeable about this. And missed injuries are a major problem. Now, Patrick, is there any collaborative effort to kind of have at least the nomenclature and efforts at early recognition uh, hardwired in Ireland, such as, again, what Dr. Dekutowski said, ER doctors, radiologists, rheumatologists, are they kind of, is there a forum to kind of highlight this problem, which it seems to be a growing problem? Uh, I, think we're, I think we're very deficient in, in, to be honest with you, in terms of the um, communication on this. Uh, I do think that there, there should almost be a kind of a notice board in every uh, emergency department just to, to highlight the, the potential of a, you know, um, the sort of situation, the sort of pathology. Um, I, uh, while we do have things, it's not something which is 
regularly enough discussed, in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's the same here, and we've tried, uh, but we failed. We had a larger publication journal for orthopedic trauma together with AO a couple of years ago. And again, the problems are clearly understood, um, but it's uh, just still not there. Um, in your own eyes, with the limited uh, images that we're giving you right now, and maybe Jerry can answer some questions, is this more a DISH or more an AS patient for your perspective? Patrick? So yeah. Look, sorry, look, please. So initially I was going more AS in my thoughts. Um, and what's interesting is this previous laminectomy for whatever reason that was. But um, yeah, I'm kind of I'm more I'm going more towards a dish now looking at further imaging. <laughs> my, first, my first my first initial reaction was uh, AS. I want everybody to know this is not scripted. In our paper, we actually identified that there is a fair bit of crossover. There's about a one in five, maybe even as much as one in three incidents of patients who have both uh, features. So the uh, vanishing end plates, but then also the uh, uh, favoring AS, but then the much hypertrophied candle wax in the front. So this patient exemplifies several things. First of all, um, uh, this is kind of a confusing picture between both, and it doesn't matter because DISH has usually much better bone than uh, AS. AS has terrible bone. Secondly, the misunderstanding of the condition, a previous surgeon felt obliged to do a laminectomy there, which makes absolutely no sense. And then thirdly, if you go to the lumbar spine, and maybe Jerry can reflect on that, there's another area of problem. This patient's had long-standing back pain, and what is this thing that we see at L4-5? Yeah, so you can see um, kind of some parrot beaking with very large uh, anterior ostophytes, but you can see that there, there's an incomplete union there. And there's been a recent um, systematic review on what's called an Anderson lesion. And uh, in the literature, it's described as multiple different pathologies with multiple different terms. But essentially, it represents like a spondylodiscitis or uh, stress fracture or focal non-union in an ankylosed spine. So there's a lot of different terms, but it's kind of all-encompassing what you can see here at L4-5, that there's just a focal segment of non-union or uh, pseudarthrosis in a grossly ankylosed spine above and below. So good morning, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, how is everything in London? Do, can we get an audible from you? Henry, good morning. Uh, it's all well here, thanks. I'm actually in Dublin here. Oh, in Dublin. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, it's all well. I actually had to uh, come home here due to our uh, internet service in the hospital being a bit affected. So uh, you might hear a bit of family chat from the background. I apologize about that. So uh, that's why the, the video at the moment was uh, there. So <laughs> Great. Good to have you. Thank you for joining us. And we're kind of in the lockdown stage again. So one question I have to you immediately. So first of all, uh, we're very interested in your lecture later on how does pulmonary function uh, get affected by thoracoplasties or AIS surgery. And your mentor, uh, Mr. Kaylee, is uh, online as well and has already voiced in. In ankylosing spondylitis, famously, the rib joints, uh, the costovertebral joints, ankylose. Are you aware of any literature that identifies the reduction of pulmonary function in these patients and how they become diaphragm breathers? Well, in wasn't really gone through in our in our paper that we, uh, to be honest, I this was not really a part of my research that I went through. But I mean, if you can think about the dynamic interplay, uh, if you look at obviously the mechanical part of breathing, your diaphragm movement, intercostal muscle, diaphragm muscles, you, you, you have your chest cage movement. Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, I, honestly, like, I mean, this, this would just be talking from my own, from my own experience here, um, it would definitely reduce it, I guess, from a restrict, a restrictive, uh, uh, point of view. So, um, cause like the restrictive patterns, although like in AIS, you can have both. And the problem with this is once you go into the tracheobronchial tree, and um, affect, affecting that, so it can be a combination of both. But I would say it's probably restrictive. Restrictive would be the major uh, the, the disease here. Restrictive lung disease. Yeah. So this is a problem, uh, Jerry. Did you run across anything in terms of pulmonary function and vital capacity reduction? Yeah. So there weren't any exact numbers. It was generalities. There is reduced pulmonary function VO two max. Um, 
tidal lung volumes, things like that. Um, surprisingly, because <clears throat> Dr. Chapman makes all of our patients perform in front of him, the incentive spirometer, uh, this patient was able to pull 2,500 on his IS. So that was kind of surprising. He had excellent lung function, but in general, they say that it's suggestive of AS when a patient has less than, I believe it's one inch of chest wall expansion in a, uh, cir in a, in a circumference measurement. Yeah, so this is uh, well said, Jerry. So this is a big deal in these AS patients that have very limited chest capacity. We're all surprised. He ha has maintained a very straight posture, which is to his uh, improvement. Kyphosis would have been a disaster. Um, uh, so those are two things. So we have um, pulmonary function restriction. We have a somewhat ailing man. We have a clearly, maybe iatrogenically enhanced uh, problem due to a previous uh, more remote laminectomy for whatever reasons that was performed, to quote Patrick uh, Kiley. And he has an L45 Anderson lesion. He did not have any other fractures, right? We did the usual spine screen. So yeah, there's no entire... non-contiguous fracture, cervical, thoracic Correct. spine. Uh, roughly how many percent of these patients have a non-contiguous fracture? I would say between 10 and 20%. And, and CT scan is gold standard. X-rays are not sufficient for this type of uh, pathology. And the fear of a missed injury is what? Uh, that eventually you might have neurologic decline later on down the road. Bingo. Secondary neurologic deterioration, epidural hematoma, not recognized, roughly 30%. Dr. Dekutowski, are you live? Can you unmute yourself? I still see you muted. I want to ask you, I know you've been a great faculty at previous trauma courses. I want to recognize that. And uh, you wowed us with some uh, of your work at the Mayo Clinic where you used to work. Uh, once I see you unmuted, I'm going to stop talking. But um, how do we treat this? Do we go just for the fracture? Do we do this percutaneously? Do we do this open? And what do we do about this Anderson lesion, assuming that this patient indeed had longstanding back pain? I don't see you unmuted yet. So I'm going to pivot this question over to Dr. Kiley. Professor Kiley, what do you think? Should we fix this? Uh, should we give it a try because there's no epidural hematoma with a brace? What are your thoughts? Um, notoriously um, poor outcomes, really, for me with conservative treatment. Um, that's one major issue. Not the awareness of recognizing the injury, but then in these pathologies, um, you have a very, very high likelihood of continued instability. And mechanically, this is an unsound situation. So I, I certainly favor fixing and fixing long. Um, yeah. L5, yeah. Would you include the L4-5 area, which uh, is clearly a non union There's basically gas contiguously through it. The body would like to heal it. Would you just put screws down there also? Or would you yeah. put a cage in the yeah. front? Yeah, I would certainly think about it. One of the things is when you're live screening in theater, you can see if that disc space is opening. You know, a vacuum disc will often see movement as you position and shift the patient around. And if you do see that kind of instability, you'll grossly see it as well under anesthesia. And you can, you can, you can, um, if you like, bypass that or or, trend, or or fix beyond it. Absolutely. If you did find that it was solid on on your, uh, if you like, examination on, on, on fluoroscopy, you might decide whether you want to go beyond it or not. I, I, that would be my initial reaction about seeing all of the imaging. Great. So Mark has a microphone problem. He just texted us, Dr. Dekutowski. Thank you. So he basically wanted us to know circulating osteoblasts and the metabolic syndrome uh, with pulmonary hypertension and the uh, diabetes or prediabetes things, all factors in this man are part of the pathophysiology. This is also why they heal better. Uh, many of these patients have unwarranted laminectomies. That's from him, uh, injunctional disease. And um, he says, absolutely surgical stabilization. So we have an agreement with uh, Ireland. And uh, he, in his series at Mayo and Rochester, identified a reduced mortality at six months using percutaneous fixation. Rod, uh, can you tell us your thoughts? You were the uh, consultant, the attending, uh, when this patient came in, surgery, not surgery, percutaneous, open, and to include this Anderson lesion, yes or no? Um, so I think the, uh, but the fact that he had a previous laminectomy and then the, um, the unstable uh, nature of the fracture and the level of pain and disability the patient had, we kind of reviewed all his options and um, he decided to go for surgical intervention. So can you show us what happened and yep. how he did? So um, <clears throat> this was a recent case uh, in the past week. Uh, he had a T9 to L5 posterior instrument infusion. Uh, this was open, it was not percutaneous. 
uh, was done on a Wilson frame, uh, would have liked to try to get a, maybe a better closing down of that fracture gap, but it's stable compared to uh, what it was in, in the pre-op. And I'm sure once he gets up, it may uh, kind of close down a little bit. So Mark, sorry, we did this traditional open. We didn't do a big disruption. He lost, I think, uh, a unit of blood, maybe 350, 400 cc's. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a, a ton. And even going down to the L5 area, it only added a few inches of incision and, and minimal blood loss. So I, I, when you're not decompressing because he doesn't have radiculopathy or stenosis type symptoms, I think it was reasonable. But intraoperatively, it was very unstable. Yeah, you can you can really see the whole thing move up and down. In fact, you can see it wedged open just from even with the Wilson frame on. Mm -hmm. So, Patrick, should we put a cage into that uh, fracture zone, that hyperextended fracture zone? The patient was actually very pleased with his new body posture. Should we put a cage in there to lock that in, or is this going to just heal in through the circulating osteoblasts? So, um, I have a low threshold for direct lateral cages, th a low thoracic spine, and lumbar spine is fine, and it's quite a nice. Addendum, and um, so depending on the stability of the patient, one other thing came to mind with these kinds of scenarios is always look for Parkinson's disease in these patients. Um, we see so many of them that we miss, um, and it's a comorbidity that you know catches you out again and again, especially if they start to go off uh, and get uh, junctionally kyphosed or, or you know progressive crouch. So it's just always um, I've I've seen it so many times where people didn't tweak that element as well. Um, and you can have concomitant pathologies and it's, it's very underappreciated. So that was just another uh, factor, but I, I would certainly have a low threshold for, um, for a, a anterior cage and probably would favor doing less invasively posterior and more invasively uh, uh, direct lateral anterior. That would be, um, and that would be because my anesthesiology colleagues would be asking me to do it that way if possible. Yeah. And Dr. Oskun, we have one of the godfathers of the far lateral procedure, so he is certainly, it's on his radar, but the patient did so well, actually. The main reason why we kept him in a little bit extra was he had a pretty significant history of alcoholism, and so we wanted to watch him an extra day or two uh, just for that. We'll ask Dr. Cook to come next. Any other thoughts? Um, Dr. Dekutowski, for instance, and I'll ask uh, uh, Rod that also lost us switching. Dr. Dekutowski said he does staggered end, uh, end level fixation. So he basically puts a screw unilaterally at one level to decrease the amount of mechanical uh, rigidity. Is that something that we should have done? Is that something you've experimented with? I think it's a good option. I'm not opposed to it. I just haven't done it. Mark, I'd love to get together with you yeah. later, Dr. Dekutowski, and uh, see how we can kind of study that. I'd certainly be interested in looking at that in greater detail. Great idea. Thanks for your contribution. Jared, Dr. Cook, introduce yourself, please, and uh, show us what your case uh, pertains to. Um, so I'm uh, Jared Cook. I trained in New Mexico at Mountain View Regional, um, and I'm one of the orthopedic spine fellows. So case that I have is a 56 year old uh, female uh, complaints of chronic back pain, uh, complaints that her uh, left foot catches on stairs, a little bit of a foot trap, some uh, balance gait instability. It's getting, uh, getting a bit worse over uh, months to years. Um, she's tried uh, uh, physical therapy and says uh, lumbar ESI without any uh, real success, uh, history of psoriatic arthritis, fibromyalgia, some connected tissue disease, um, no prior spine surgeries. So her physical exam shows that she has a little bit, um, a little bit of uh, weakness distally and uh, then absence of, uh, of her reflexes of the uh, patella and Achilles. Um, so her imaging in her thoracic spine is a little bit of a coronal plane deformity, um, but otherwise, uh, not much to speak of. And then, uh, spinal allostasis, uh, seen, um, kind of grade one, two, and then grade one at, uh, L4, five and five S1 respectively. So now let's go thoracic and then lumbar. So in her thoracic spine, she has a, uh, T89, a uh, large calcific disc herniation uh, that you can see here. And that's the, uh, uh, corresponds with the, the bottom axial cut uh, here. And then uh, at six, seven, there's a, uh, another uh, calcified disc. Uh, it's smaller and it's on the, um, uh, on the opposite side. Um, so you see the axial cut from that. And then uh, she's a little kyphotic in between. The MRI at that point uh, looks like this. There's a uh, little bit of uh, cord signal there. And then in the lumbar spine, the CT myelogram is, um, is showing that, you know, she is quite stenotic, mostly uh, at, um, 
uh, L4, L5, that's that top axial. And, um, you know, the bottom, uh, really, a, a broad, uh, disc bulge with uh, lower recess and framal stenosis. So what we're looking at is, um, a T67, uh, spondylosis, thoracic kyphosis, large calcific disc herniation, uh, they're in at, uh, T89, the spondies at L4, 5, and 5S1, um, with radiculopathy and neurogenic claudication. So here's kind of the question of the day. Um, when you take care of this stuff, do you take care of it all at once? Do you stage it? Uh, which do you do first? How far apart would you do them if you uh, were to stage them? I'm gonna open that one up. So go back to the neuroimaging. This is again, one of those classic problems. Patrick, I'll go to you first. So this patient has a clear, severe presenting problem with bad back pain. Can you go to the CT again? So she has a two level, uh, probably degenerative spondy. And on clinical exam, we found clear signs of a thoracic myelopathy. She has kind of this accentuated degenerative round back, not horrible, but it's just a degenerative uh, kyphosis. Um, I forgot what the degrees were, but assume roughly 60 degrees. So not by itself pathologic, but clearly a large calcific disc herniation, some gait unsteadiness. So her presenting complaint is back pain, but we find something different. She has actually very little thoracic pain. She has some numbness and radiating uh, symptoms on the right side of her chest. Patrick, how do you handle that when you see something that is quite different from the patient, but that concerns you far more? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I'm glad that I'm focusing more on kids these days. Um, so uh, in this sort of setting, um, I think it's good to get an outside objective opinion. So I would certainly talk to a neurologist that I trust in terms of I'm making a diagnosis of myelopathy. I want to make sure that that's accurate and there's no other pathologies potentially present this scenario. Um, if she's got flowered my myopathy and, and changes um, on MR as well, um, then I think, you know, you've got to look at the, the, the natural history of, of that. Um, and have a serious discussion, but that's not, not a procedure without its, uh, its potential risks and complications to her and her cord. Um, when you start talking in this kind of scenario with these individuals, in my experience, they're kind of not focused so much on the problem they didn't know they had. They're going to be um, focused on their back pain and, and lower symptoms. And, and so it's, 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 you know, you, well, Communicating about both is, is a challenge and, and trying to give the options and come to rationale for which one first depends on your patient's opinion, your, your colleague's opinion, and, and, then, um, and, and then sometimes we might consider whether you do any trials to confirm what, where the primary symptom source is. But it, it, it's a, it's, this is what, what are these, do they call it a vomit? She's a victim of, uh, of incidental um, imaging. Um, <laughs> of an ancillary area now. And so, you know, the knives have been sharpened for, for a problem which was hitherto unknown. Well, well said, but this is actually based on physical exam. But so this is a great point. Would you ever conceive doing two non-contiguous area surgeries that are moderately big, uh, one being higher risk of thoracic spine simultaneously in your pediatric patients? Or is this something that you'd really prefer to not do and uh, stage and stagger it? But yeah, whether it's adult or pediatric, I would tend to deal with it separately. I, I, it's, it's, for me, that would be um, and just a much more pragmatic way of doing it. Um, but uh, it does depend on your center, how much backup you have and, and uh, support, but that might, I would tend to stage it. In the chat room, we have Dr. Ilfanullah Shah. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Shah. And he says, no question, thoracic spine first. Dr. Dekutowski cautions us, as we all are very aware of, calcific discs and durectasia uh, are closely uh, correlated. Big problem. Uh, Rot, what do you say? Uh, thoracic spine first. Do we do something that the patient doesn't want done first, or is, uh, she wants to have the back fixed first? I mean, honestly, it's a, it's a difficult um decision, but I think, you know, I think I would go for, I tend to go for the lesions that are um, more symptomatic. Um, in this case, I think it's difficult because the patient's got one fixed on one thing and the pathology somewhere else. So I think staging it and having a frank um, 
discussion with the patient and doing some shared decision making. Now, uh, Henry Turner, um, not currently in Dublin, but usually in London, um, thoracic kyphosis. Um, she obviously has a, we don't have the great postural view here right now, but assume that she has a, a accentuated round back. It's about 60 degrees plus, not horrible, but she has thoracic myelopathy. We rated her, I think, a neuric too. Is that right, Jared? Uh, yeah, I believe it's two. Yeah. She's still, she's still working. Um, she's still working. She has a federal job. Uh, do we do a single level fusion? At what point in time of degrees of kyphosis does this adversely affect pulmonary function or impact cardiopulmonary if we look at it as a functional unit uh, um, efficiency? We have a lot of, um, at least we have a lot, well, I guess we have a lot of leeway when looking at coronal and the schedule plane deformities. Um, I would not for kyphosis in itself, especially around about 60 degrees, I wouldn't see that as an indication um, first to just go through and I won't, and I won't get to go through with surgery in itself. And the other way is just around, I mean, we have such a wide range of an acceptable kyphosis um, and especially this is still not gone into the lower doses thing. It's more when you go into a lower doses where you would affect maybe, okay, you have to correct that to improve your, uh, pulmonary function. So from a pure pulmonary function point of view, I wouldn't say 60 degrees is, is bad. I would say it's actually, it can probably improve things, you know, or, it, or it's fine. You know, if I, I would have rather gone from to 60 degrees than from tw 12 or 30, you know, so um, the literature about that is actually not that there's not that much about that. People say, tend to focus on the scoliosis cop angle and you know all the literature if you look at the iowa natural history studies all of them they they kind of focus on the cob angle but not there's not a lot of mention of actually of scoliosis but because we do know that hypo lower doses or hypokyphosis is more the issue along with the interplay with intercostal muscles chest case expansion and you know disruption of the chest cage um with surgery so Great, yeah. great point. So I think that the overemphasis on Cobb angle correction is spot on. I think that the uh, sagittal balance is uh, something that the ISSG has really deserved a lot of credit for. And I want to credit one of our fellows, Dr. Tataran, who's kind of come up with the disimpaction or uh, elongation of the trunk. He has a nice paper coming out in the near future where he basically actually measured height gain through deformity surgery and uh, thereby creating a larger cardiopulmonary reserve space relative to the lower or so. so I thought that was a brilliant idea and his numbers are actually very surprising. We'll feature that at a later date. Um, so let's just move forward here, Jared. What do we do and uh, standing open for criticism? As you're doing this, by the way, um, uh, Dr. Dekutowski, again, point out number one, dural tear risk and stay out of an anterior approach for the thoracic spine. I think there's a general agreement to do the thoracic spine first uh, and then the lumbar spine second. Um, the other question was, do we do a single level uh, thoracic uh, postulatal decompression? compression, we do this transfacetal usually, or do we kind of try to straighten out a thoracic spine? So Jared, take us through the case. Okay. So, um, so the thoracic spine was, uh, was addressed first. Um, so there were, uh, laminectomies, transfacet decompression, C6 to T9, uh, posterior three column osteotomies at, uh, T6, seven and eight, nine. Um, and then, uh, endoscopic assisted resection of that, uh, eight, nine calcific disc. Um, and posterior fusion of T4 to T11. So here is our stage one um, afterward. And then- Was there a dural tear? Uh, there no. was, no. No, we used an endoscope. We identified healthy dura above and below. And then with uh, very small microscopic tools teased off uh, the calcium. We're lucky that uh, the dura stayed intact and no monitoring, I think, stayed the same or actually got a little bit better. And then, of course, don't neglect the L-spine. So um, this is uh, this was done six months later, and um, that was uh, addressed with uh, posterior uh, inner body fusion of uh, both levels um, and wide laminectomies. And so that's what we have. And these ones actually were able to be pulled, unlike the originals. Um, so here we have uh, our uh, good alignment films. So you can uh, see both constructs. So Rod, so this looks like an extensive amount of surgery and a, a 
Yeah, go back again. Yeah, so patient was very happy. So sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jared. She was actually very happy with the result. I have a question for uh, Patrick in a second, but uh, critique me here. I mean, I went pretty far out. I did her entire thoracic spine because it just looked like a chain reaction of hyperkyphosis spondylosis. Uh, we then, with a delay, uh, and I want to credit Dr. Glenn David, our, one of our great interventionalists and our head of our interventional program here, who uh, did several injections in the low back and kind of kept her going. Is this too much? Uh, I mean, the final balance looks pretty good, but what are your thoughts? I mean, I think <clears throat> it sounds like the radiculopathy and the uh, lumbar spine issues resolved. Yeah, she was very yeah. happy. She's yeah, basically... I, mean, I think that's the. I think that's the ultimate. Um, you know, if I think if you relieve the patient's symptoms now, it sounds like the thoracic was a little bit more um, for you know neurologic uh, compromise rather than pain. So I think. I mean, I think the only question is is that um, you know what happens, and I think this is an unknown: is what happens to the unfused segments long term. So uh, that's my question to yeah. Patrick. So you obviously have a great body of work in Dublin with your uh, kids. And so it was so great to see your work the other day and the Global Spine Congress uh, with some very impressive live videos of what your kids do. How many motion segments do you want to keep intact? And um, what's, uh, what's kind of the minimum number of motion segments? And what do you prognosticate for this patient who is uh, a pretty active 54-year-old, although she's a little bit a large yeah, I suppose that this, we're trying to keep as many motion segments as possible. And the fact that you're fixing from my L4 to pelvis, I mean, she's going to have a very uh, small reserve, really. Uh, I, I, it looks like really nice work. Uh, one of the concerns I'd have about the situation would be you've quite a, a rigid thoracic construct there. Um, and whether you need to instrument it or whether you could have got away with a decompression, a unilateral decompression without destabilizing the spine or producing more kyphosis and potentially preserved a bit more elasticity throughout her, uh, her torso. Um, fair credit to you. Well, in staging it, I'd have had the fear that if you've corrected her kyphosis, but she had, or you've interfered with her kyphosis, and then you've left the lumbar spine, um, you know, she's not neurotic until you've done the second stage of <laughs> Uh, the surgery in the lumbar area and um, she maintained balance till then which was, was nice to see uh, but uh, yeah I, I would certainly be concerned about her trying to exaggerate movement through the upper lumbar area and thoracolumbar junction in this she's certainly at, at risk of, of junctional issues yes, but it's results yeah, we we talked about that with her. So she has basically five uh, motion segments that we're now going to key on and we're going to uh, use our role as surgeons to regularly follow her up and to really try to stay in her head to activate her trunk muscles and be smart about her back. But uh, I, I am worried that the underlying footprint of this degeneration is going to uh, uh, kind of within 10 years require further surgery. Three plus segments, at least you'd want to be preserving five is much better than three, obviously. And um, but the question is, which zones of the spine are, are potentially the most mobile? And she's lost them now. <laughs> yeah. We left her SI joints unfused. So these are sacral ALA screws to supplement the S1 fixation. Uh, so yes, the SI joints will hopefully give like a three degree buffer zone, but whether that matters or not, I don't know. And uh, whether they'll become a pain generator for Dr. David to work with in the future, we'll see. Uh, but um, so far, so good. But yeah, thanks for your comments. And again, I want to point out Dr. Uh, uh, Dekotowski is always very important uh, points. He wants us to, and let's go for uh, Dr. Freybert. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, he points out uh, hip extensor strength and hip motion as a very important exam for angst bond patients, but also for these patients with more complex uh, multifactorial diseases. For chest volume, uh, Kirk Wood, our, our great friend who's now at Stanford around 1992, did a very nice job in terms of correlating kyphosis. And um, <clears throat> Uh, again, mid uh, lumbar screw trajectory, he identified use of obliquity to avoid junctional facets. So uh, starting the screws low in the pedicle and aiming high to stay out of the facets is great. By the way, I see in our, uh, in our uh, group, uh, Professor um, Tariq Sahail from Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, welcome here and uh, 
congratulations on doing a fantastic job with the Pakistan Spine Society. It was a great honor speaking with your group um, uh, last Saturday. Um, really congratulate you. Dr. Freibert, introduce yourself and show us what uh, you found as an interesting case. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Yev Freibert, neurosurgery spine fellow here at Swedish. I'll uh, present this case. Uh, the uh, patient in question is a 72-year-old female who uh, came to our clinic, uh, I think, three years ago at this point, uh, with increased difficulty walking, was basically non-ambulatory presentation, uh, had an intermittent thoracic sensory level, kind of high thoracic around T3, T4, uh, progressive hand weakness and declining bowel and bladder control. Um, the patient had uh, an ACDF uh, at an outside hospital five years prior. She also had a pretty extensive thoracolumbar fusion three years prior, also at an outside hospital. Uh, and her other medical history included uh, um, stage three chronic kidney disease, COPD, uh, hep B, and chronic opioid use, which sadly is still probably on the healthy side for some of the patients that we see. Um, on physical exam, she had patchy weakness, uh, as demonstrated in the chart there, um, reduced sensation below T3, uh, bilateral upgoing Babinski's, and was basically non, non ambulatory uh, at gate testing. Um, this is some of her imaging. These are uh, Scully films demonstrating that uh, that uh, ACDF uh, and the you know very large uh, thoracolumbar fusion uh, that was previously done. Uh, you can appreciate that there's some uh, coronal misalignment of the cervical spine uh, relative to, to the rest of her spine, uh, but otherwise her sagittal alignment actually isn't isn't too terrible for uh, uh, for somebody her age. Um, and Again, I just is, want to point out, this was a fusion surgery done in an outside hospital yes, here yes, in Seattle, I, so we have no responsibility for the neck or the thoracic spine. I just yes. want to make that preemptive statement. Absolutely, yes. I, I, I emphasize that as well. Um, this is uh, this is the CT of her uh, of her C spine, uh, you know, demonstrating the uh, obvious deformity there, uh, as well as uh, collapse of multiple non-operated levels. Uh, that's the um, axial cut at the level of the the prior ACDF. Uh, this is the MRI, uh, also of the C-spine, uh, demonstrating uh, no actual central uh, stenosis of the um, of the C-spine. And I wasn't able to find very good cuts, but the patient did have pretty severe foraminal stenosis lower down uh, in the in the lower cervical spine. Um, the other critical finding is the um, the proximal portion of the uh, thoracolumbar construct. Uh, you can appreciate that uh, T3 and T4 uh, were uh, cement reinforced. Uh, there's definitely some screw pullout uh, of T4 and, and T5, and uh, a little bit more subtle, but uh, there's definitely some cement extrusion into the canal space uh, around T4 and maybe going up until T3. Um, and this is, uh, and that's also a myelogram demonstrating that there's uh, pretty much a complete block of, of construct uh, of a contrast rather uh, uh, at the level of that cement extrusion. Uh, this is the MRI, uh, you know, a little bit degraded by um, by artifact, but again, pretty severe stenosis at uh, at T3, T4. So there's, you know, there's there's quite a few considerations in this case. Uh, primarily, there's multiple concurrent findings. You know, there's the there's the cervical deformity. Uh, the patient has symptomatic cervical foraminal stenosis. She was definitely experiencing declining um, uh, hand function. Uh, there's proximal thoracic hardware failure, uh, and uh, the patient has thoracic stenosis and myelopathy um, uh, secondary to the uh, extruded cement, among other things. So, uh, you know, there's there's additional questions. Uh, is this something that's worth um, uh, pursuing in a focal or staged fashion? Uh, or does it make sense to do this uh, kind of comprehensively pretty much all at once? Uh, and then finally, the, the timing of intervention. Uh, you know, this, this patient is, is present, presenting uh, profoundly myelopathic, um, uh, but generally speaking, not, not particularly optimized for the large surgery that she might need. So great uh, points. Uh, I remember her distinctly. She couldn't walk anymore, but she got breathless whenever she tried to sit up. So they did a beautiful job at that outside hospital within. Can you go back to that CT, maybe that sagittal CT of the upper thoracic spine? Did a great job with sagittal balancing. Uh, she obviously has an underlying rheumatoid disease. She has the angular deformities of her fingers, for instance. Uh, Patrick, uh, you deal with uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, you deal with illus danlos and connective tissue diseases. Um, what tricks do you have in your armamentarium to prevent uh, screw pullout when you have to do fusions in OI patients, for instance, osteogenesis imperfecta? 
Yeah, I, I suppose um, that, that's a really good question. So I suppose in our in our kid population, when we have poor bone quality, we certainly don't probably use augmentation anywhere near uh, as much. Um, it's unpredictable, it's biologically inert and almost doomed to failure. Um, so that's something we, we very, very rarely use. Um, we would tend to use sublaminar bands and soft fixation um, more often um, with very poor bone quality. The other thing we're a big fan of is sometimes staging your anchor um, point uh, insertion. So maybe doing preemptive anchor point insertions at an early stage and allowing them to consolidate before loading them by applying rods and, and corrective forces. Uh, those are a few things that we would strongly consider. Um, and if there's anything we can do from the perspective of biologics, we look at that um, as an adjunct, because when you're inter interfering or uh, if you like freshening up the bone uh, healing interface, uh, your, your biologics may have a very powerful uh, effect, particularly if you use um, um, anti-catabolic agents as well as anabolic agents together. So, so those would be a few things which come to mind kind of in the, in the kids where you have poor bone or poor connective tissue or both. Um, but this is an interesting scenario. I, I, just looking at the, uh, the scans, I get the suggestion that maybe she's like, of course she looks more in a reduced position when she's got, got her myelogram and her, um, and her MRI, but uh, she may have a true, truly more significant instability on a standing view. Really interesting to just to target in and see what she's like and if she, how much she's shifting because uh, the screw um, halo does say to us that she's shifting and translating massively. So for me, the money is on the upper thoracic problem, what more than the neck, which has probably been grumbling on for, for a while. Absolute bingo, great assessment with very limited images. Thank you so much. Um, so indeed, we identified a non-union, I think, down to about T7. Uh, all the screws were loose there, or T8, actually. Uh, there was a halo effect, and uh, one of our great fellows, Dr. Pratt, is actually quantifying that right now. Um, the deformity in the uh, upright x-rays, which we tried to get, was um, actually more in the coronal pain. So she shifted over to the side, which was kind of weird. Um, she did have a pretty good uh, fixation, but her screws basically, or the rods backed out, so they're almost subcutaneous. So you can literally see a windshield wiper on these images. The patient was actually quite upset because she somehow did not remember ever consenting to cement application. The spine here, she had a large cement extrusion, which did not seem to be a problem until she developed this uh, non-union. And then the cord would basically uh, pilfer against that. Um, Rod, when we go for a complex deformity reduction, in a salvage situation, upper thoracic spine, we usually go to the lower cervical spine. Uh, do you ever stop at C7 or do we just have to go to C2? And how do you accommodate for this? Can you go to the C spine again, this ugly cervical spine? Do we just accept that or what do we do? I mean, I think you, um, it, did we have, yeah. I mean, the MRI kind of shows um, that it's pretty complex. I don't think you can necessarily, I think my feeling on a case like this is that um, doing something small, uh, maybe could work, but, um, you know, in order to fix the problem, I think you have to look at the whole global picture. And I think, you know, if you, if you end it somewhere in the subaxial spine, there's already a pseudo, she's already got kyphosis and she's pulling out her hardware. So, uh, either you fix it, I think, or you d don't do anything. That's my feeling on it. I want to thank you. Uh, we, it's so great to have, uh, we have, uh, five spine surgeons here who are all very experienced. So uh, it's uh, great for us. Uh, Patrick Healy was talking about that earlier. We can always call upon our colleagues to provide second and third opinions, and we frequently disagree. Um, in the interest of time, you have take us forward. What do we do and how do we justify it? How did she do three years later? Sure. Yeah. So after pretty extensive uh, risk benefit uh, discussion, uh, comprehensive intervention was, uh, was offered. Um, uh, which included cervical uh, pre-existing cervical hardware removal, uh, two levels of ACDF, um, uh, complete corpectomy of T4 and a partial corpectomy of T3 to, to really decompress the, um, the cord uh, from the front, uh, although the procedure was done from the back. Um, uh, C2 to T2 uh, fusion with connection to the, the prior hardware, 
uh, and then uh, plastic surgery wound closure, given kind of the extensive nature of the of the procedure. Uh, the intervention was actually uh, uneventful, uh, and the pa the patient was discharged after a fairly lengthy, uh, understandably lengthy, I would say, um, hospital stay on post op day eleven. Um, she was last seen three years after her surgery with a fairly normalized strength and sensation. She's ambulatory, and really her her current issue is just a residual um, residual pain, which is managed conservatively fairly successfully. So we did not address the um, previous surgery in the thoracolumbar junction. We did a, a resection from costal transectomy approaches of the cement. Um, and uh, we did uh, actually start with the cervical spine just to get that straight uh, so we can kind of keep her head over her shoulders. And then did a posterior decompression fusion. We stayed out of the dural sac. We're fortunate about that. So the cement dissection was very difficult and we used several drills under irrigation to core that out and disimpact the cord and then straighten her out uh, around this radiolucent cage. So she actually had a very favorable result and her breathlessness vanished. Um, so this is uh, again a, a really difficult uh, situation uh, for, um, for us. Uh, Henry, thoracic volumes, uh, uh, breathing volumes, respiratory volumes, this patient has a confounding disorder of COPD. She has pain in her chest. She splints. Uh, how can we get objective thoracic volume measurements uh, in a patient who really can't get up? So she's literally at up to about 30 degrees inclination. So um, there's a few papers in the literature looking at CT measurement, although this is obviously uh, static measurements. And then there are some um, newer developments looking at dynamic MRI imaging, uh, obviously with its own caveats and shortcomings. Um, I think this is one of the questions that actually comes up with early onset scoliosis as well, because you have patients, well, in that case, in this case, you have a patient who is immobile and with due to all her comorbids, you can really get an accurate uh, result. Uh, with the early onset patients, you get patients who do not really understand or were not in a condition. So uh, CT has been used. Uh, there's a paper uh, out by um, Fujita et al. not too long ago, 2019, which they quantified, um, you know, looking at the impact of fusion. And this was in AIS though, but long volume uh, measured with com you know, computer tomography. And then they correlated with um, pulmonary function uh, results. So there is that, there is, like I said, dynamic MRI imaging, uh, it's a bit more advanced. Um, then uh, you can, like in someone, if let's say once she gets up and she's walking around, uh, you can try and reverse, uh, try and give her some uh, bronchodilators to try and see if you can get a better result with that. But I mean, at the same time, you have someone who, um, I mean, COPD is not going to go away. So how accurate your results are with that is also debatable. So um, CT is one thing, but that just gives you static lung volume, dynamic MRI uh, if you have facilities, but then again, very specialized. Um, your options are quite restricted. Bedside spirometry, if you have it, inspiratory pressures, you get mobile uh, uh, inspiratory pressure meters uh, are available on the market and some people there are some uh, research there is research coming out that looking at the the value of inspiratory pressure measurement being uh, more uh, reliable than um, you know just the traditional pfts so there are all these things that you can look at but i mean again um, it is a complex situation so and with res with limited resources it can be tricky so these are really valuable points. I think we have many options or many opportunities for further uh, um, study and understanding of our patients. I'll ask Zach uh, to just to come to the microphone and just to give a pretty verbal. Um, the, the key point where I want this shown is this patient had terrible, uh, simple bedside incentive spirometry. And uh, Zach, can you come to the microphone? Just give a verbal about what your thoughts are in terms of trunk re-expansion or torso re-expansion. Um, so that's a really uh, interesting case for me because she had bad COPD. She was declared a high surgical risk. And she actually, this is no joke, um, does aerobics and uh, her COPD medications have nearly gone. And she had this terrible longstanding pain in her thoracic spine, probably from these non-unions that uh, prevented her from, or uh, caused splinting, prevented her from fully pulling in air. Um, 
while Zach is getting keyed up just for three minutes as well, Zach, um, uh, Patrick, can you talk about supplemental thoracic fixation? And also a question in the chat room was, what about biphosphonates and OI? Maybe take the last one first. Do you and kids give biphosphonates for OI surgery? Okay, so uh, OI is a, a case scenario where you need to be a bit careful if they've been on bisphosphonates already because bisphosphonates can switch off the, the bone turnover completely if they've been used chronically. But bisphosphonates are very useful if they've not been used for, for a while if they, no or if they've been used um, because if you like what you're doing is you're switching down the osteoclastic bone resorption, you're giving formation um, potential at the upper hand. So that's really, really helpful if you're trying to get consolidation and fusion around your implant or around your fixation. There certainly could be grounds for thinking about a HA coating your, uh, your instrumentation as well. So that would be uh, two of the thoughts I'd have about, um, about OI and, and biologics. Um, sometimes in an established pseudotosis case, whether it's adult or pediatric, we'll again consider uh, anabolics like bone um, morphogenetic proteins and that kind of agent, uh, which has a synergistic effect with bisphosphonates or anti anti-catabolic agents. So those those are certainly um, factors that I always think. But more simply, if we think about it as surgeons and doctors, the first things we got to think about is our patients. Like diabetic diabetes is notorious. Are they smokers? Are they uh, their nutritional status, are they using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and steroids, which are rampant um, and, and really have biologically negative effects no matter what we're trying to do as surgeons. So I think th there's a whole milieu of things which, which we can, uh, can think about to optimize uh, the patient's biological performance no matter what surgery we impose on them. Super. And then hooks, you made a comment in the chat room on hooks in the thoracic spine, supplemental hooks. Yes. So um, if there's been some literature looking at um, the, the pullout quality, the posterior pullout strength, I'm going to send you a picture, Jens. Um, um, and if you have a, a claw configuration in the upper thoracic spine, if you like a paraspinal thoracic um, uh, fixation, it has much superior strength than pedicle screws uh, and rod alone because of the, the lever forces and the strength of the posterior rib, ribs. So I've used that once or twice in revision kyphosis cases. I, which I call it the light bulb operation because the, uh, the rods end up looking like the filaments of the light bulb. Um, and uh, I certainly can share that case with you at some stage or other. Um, which certainly was a learning for me. Um, I, I'd heard Richard Gross speaking about this and in a couple of difficult situations with Marfan syndrome or other situations, I found it to be quite a useful adjunct to think about, um, if you like, stabilizing and shortening the posterior thorax. What's also interesting about this, because we touched on respiratory function, is if you actually get someone's thoracic spine into a slightly more extended position, you normally bring their upper ribs from a quite a vertical and oblique line into a um, more horizontal uh, place or space. And that actually en ends up uh, increasing the volume of the apex, apical region of the lungs. So you increase the residual volume significantly, potentially by um, moving or extending the, the posterior thorax with your fixation. And uh, sorry, I have a lateral on that, on that case. We well, flashed so. it up. Patrick just sent me this image. This is very cool, Patrick. Thanks. This explains a lot. So rib hooks are very, very illustrative and very creative. We've not done this in adults. I know some people have used uh, a rib tethering, but uh, this is very cool to see. Yeah, very well, it uh, wasn't my idea, but it certainly helped bail me out of a, a difficult situation, which I'll happily share with you. <laughs> No, oh, thank you. Uh, quickly, Zach Tataran had prepared a complex case. We're going to bypass that. Thank you, Zach, for your understanding. Really good uh, contributions, insights, Patrick. Uh, but he has uh, just some statements about torso lengthening and uh, general function. So this is red hot off the press. And again, thank you for understanding that we're not showing your case right now. We'll definitely show that. It's a Ben. I had a picture to show. Ben, we need help. Ben. <coughs> ben. Thank you, Ben, for all your help. Oh, there we go. No, all no, right, we're good. fire away, um, Zach Tataran. So just briefly, I, I'll present my 
awesome giant cell tumor next time. But um, we were working on a paper that seems to be coming to fruition now. Ah, that's me. Um, so we analyzed uh, 198 patients, uh, adult patients. We measured their height pre and post adult spinal deformity surgery correction, because honestly, we always tell patients, they probably get, then they always ask in clinic, how much taller am I going to get after you correct my spinal deformity? And we always say one to two inches, but there's like never anything actually concrete to tell them. So we sought to develop a formula based on the levels. Um, and essentially we analyzed, uh, 189 patients, measured them pre and post spinal deformity surgery with the, if you can see that picture there. Um, and on average, we found that, uh, based on our, our corrections, uh, people gained an average of seven and a half centimeters pre and post surgery. And this is the breakdown as to where they gained the height from based on this picture. I'm not sure what else you wanted me to say, Dr. Chu. No, but uh, just height gain. So roughly height gain in major upper thoracic lumbar pelvic fixation was how many centimeters again? Seven and a half. Seven and a half centimeters. So this obviously would disimpact the upper torso from the lower torso and mm -hmm. hopefully can be shown to have a cardiopulmonary effect. Great idea, Zach. Uh, really uh, cool. We're looking at radiographic validations and go into the physiology. But I thought this was a great context to um, Mr. Turner's lecture. So thanks also for being willing to uh, take your giant cell tumor discussion Next. on and table that for another time. Um, can we flash up that lateral of uh, Mr. Kiley for a second? Um, we just flashed that for it. It's a great honor to introduce as we're flashing this up, um, Mr. Henry Turner. So this is the lateral. Patrick, any comments on that? So this guy had developed a very nasty junctional pyrosis and uh, post German surgery previously. And um, he... <laughs> had basically become reclusive. He was in the Northwest of the country and had disappeared into his room, uh, was depressed um, and almost suicidal. And so we were looking at it and we, we looking at, at the, the problem, you know, of, of course the option was there to go higher into the neck. Uh, but I, I, I certainly have had cases where with junctional kyphosis, even going into the cervical spine, you still kind of have a potential PJK uh, issue afterwards, and um, so, so that that light bulb went off in my head. I hang about about the thoracic fixation because I I've been at a um, at a, a couple of presentations about this, and I I just thought in this case that might actually get us out of trouble because we, we knew we had to uh, approach the posterior instrumentation anyway. So uh, so this was the the, the long term um, this short term and long term outcome for a significant junctional kyphosis issue, and it certainly taught me. A lesson not to forget about um, the rib cage, the sternum, when we're looking at spinal alignment, because we often just focus completely on spinal anatomy and forget the fourth dimension, which is the thorax. Um, and there is potential, if you think about the fourth dimension, to uh, to actually um, achieve something from a spinal perspective as well. Hey, so question, Patrick, before we go to uh, Mr. Taylor. Um, uh, Amin Hanin has a question that is plural injury by placing hooks into the ribs, uh, pneumothoraces, any tips or tricks, any concerns? Do you fuse the ribs to the spine? Very, 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 very rare. I use hooks around the ribs a lot. And because you're posterior, you often have quite a deep um, space between the pleura and the rib itself. There's quite a degree of adventitia and muscle tissue there. Um, the posterior rib is also quite a strong um, cortex. So it's not it's quite easy to sneak around um, at the back of the rib, just posterior to the angle and, and, uh, and, and to get fixation without violating the, uh, the intrapleural space. And that, um, it certainly hasn't. I, I've also seen plenty of spontaneous pneumothoraces um, just doing a scoliosis correction or kyphosis correction uh, de novo, and that's a non marfan's patient. So every year, if you look carefully enough for it, and you'll see that there is certainly in, in small percentage numbers, there are spontaneous pneumothoraces that occur, regardless of where your uh, anesthesia team put the central lines. So it's not just, it's not just, it's not just hooks, um, and it's, it's potentially a, a possibility. 
So please feel free to great points uh, to uh, help me introduce Mr. Turner, but uh, Henry Turner is our guest lecturer for the STED talk today. He's completed his primary medical degree at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, South Africa, did three years of um, surgical work in Johannesburg and moved to Ireland. He's a member of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland since 2018 and has completed his master's thesis uh, in 2021. He's a registrar in trauma and orthopedic surgery at St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And he's done some great work that came across our horizon on the effects of thoracoplasty and pulmonary function. Uh, and we found this to be really noteworthy and educational for all of us. Thank you, Henry, for joining us. And Patrick, anything else you'd want to add to the introduction? No, uh, we've really uh, valued having Henry on our staff and thankfully in St. James's Hospital, he's already warming up the site of our new children's hospital, which is that rather large, um, almost looks like a sports stadium, doesn't it, at the end? Um, that's, that's being built. It's potentially going to be the most expensive children's hospital on the planet. Um, but at least Henry's keeping an eye on it. Take a look, can you, can you see the, the sunrise? Can you see it on the screen? Yeah, it's Beautiful, beautiful sunrise in Seattle just for you here, uh, Patrick. Go for it. Right. Um, thank can you, you very into, much. Can you Dr. go into Chapman. presentation mode, Dr. Turner? Uh, Mr. Yes. Turner, presentation yeah. mode. Great. So, uh, yeah, I just would say thank you very much for uh, having me today. Um, I am trying to share this with you guys now. Is it coming up? The, yep, it's uh, just not in presenter mode. We just see your whole screen. So it just needs to go into the, so there you go. How's that? Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's an honor to be able to present here uh, for you the uh, just the findings that we've come across in our research here. Um, yeah, it's just an honor to be there with you and to, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible. Uh, and I know that you guys are quite busy there. So um, lung function after IIS should probably be posterior corrective surgery. What are the effects of thoracoplasty? Um, this is from uh, myself and uh, Mr. Kiley uh, from Children's South Ireland in Dublin. Uh, Children's South Ireland have a few uh, sites in Dublin uh, and satellite sites, uh, small prisons around the country. That photo at the bottom right there is actually the hopeful end product. Uh, which is causing quite a bit of a stir in politics in Ireland and in Europe, but yeah, be some later talking about that. So um, looking at just my financial relationships, I have nothing to declare. Um, so what to start off, what are the effects of AIS on lung function? Um, we know that it causes airway narrowing, it also reduces lung volume. It alters chest wall mechanics. This is increased airway resistance and can cause restrictive lung spirometry patterns. So it is kind of a mixed disease. Uh, previous reports noted a restrictive, it's kind of uh, goes up saying that it would obviously cause restrictive uh, lung disease, but it is actually uh, researched by Farrell and Elf in 2018 uh, has found that um, it can have a mixed picture and with some obstructive uh, things as well. So it's obviously um, much more dynamic and complex interplay of factors. When we look at the previous studies, looking at, you know, specifically at the cardiopulmonary uh, complications of AIS, um, famously in the 60s, the papers by Nilsson, Lundgren, uh, Elfinson, uh, Fowles, and Nachemsen uh, painted quite a grim picture about disability, increased cardiopulmonary complications, as well as mortality. Although these studies uh, were later deemed to be probably slightly unreliable because in many of these studies, the etiology for the scoliosis was unclear. Um, a lot of them did not uh, contain any uh, radiographs and non-idiopathic uh, diagnoses patients were included, including uh, quite severe early onset scoliosis, polio, neuromuscular patients. Uh, we just see all of the old techniques there for treatments coming from the 18th and uh, 19th and early 20th century. Uh, this was then followed up by the very famous Iowa Natural History Studies, uh, started in 1976 by um, uh, Stuart Weinstein, uh, basically looked at uh, papers previously published by Ponsetti from the 50s, and then uh, retrospectively, and then followed this cohort for about 51 years at least, um, and he published his findings in 2019 there. Uh, in, in a nice summary document, which basically showed that uh, only patients 
uh, who have a cob of more at 50 degrees at maturity, and especially with the thoracic apex, um, will have decreased objectively measured uh, pulmonary function tests. And then as well, any cob above 80, degree, uh, 80 degrees will show decreased pulmonary function on testing. In contrast to the original uh, studies uh, from the 60s, they actually found it was very rare to develop pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. And they also did not find any real evidence of increased mortality uh, in patients with AIS. Uh, this, just to remember, this is an idiopathic scoliosis in AIS. So just a history of thoracoplasty itself started in the late 19th century as a treatment for tuberculosis and empyema. This is something that we saw uh, you know, the complications of tuberculosis and empyema in, in South Africa quite a bit. Um, it was then adopted by Richard Folkman, German surgeon there, uh, who uh, made rib deformity resection. Uh, for a few patients, just I think one or two, uh, two or three patients um, who treated his scoliosis patients with this deformity resection. And then obviously subsequently developed on from there. Uh, although we do note that in the literature, it has had decreasing use in the last 30 years. Um, there's obviously a significant amount of debate and controversy around thoracoplasty. Its perceived advantages would be you know, improved rib hump, rib hump correction, um, improved self-image scores, and then obviously provision of autograft for fusion. Um, the obvious disadvantage would be the concerns about pulmonary function deterioration and also increased morbidity, neuralgia, uh, post-operative complications, perioperative complications such as pulmonary uh, contusion, uh, effusions and uh, higher risk of pneumonia. And then again, there are alternatives av available such as postromedial translation and direct vertebral rotation, although there is some debate about the, the amount of robot correction. Now, once you go start going into the controversy, when does this become a cosmetic procedure due to its morbidity and what are the actual real deleterious effects on PFTs? Um, this made us think, you know, has this been quantified? And to the best of our knowledge, there was no review in the literature that actually compared the effects of PSF, which is the gold standard still uh, for AIS corrective surgery, to those with PSF and thoracoplasty. Uh, thoracoplasty by itself obviously is quite rare these days, and any other surgical approaches usually uh, violate the anterior chest wall. So we wanted to look at these two uh, in conjunction uh, or, or versus each other, looking at percent predicted pulmonary function tests in patients with AIS. So this is just a study that we did there, lung function of the posterior corrective surgery and thoracoplasty in AIS. It's a meta-analysis systematic review by myself, uh, Robin McManus, and Mr. Pat Kiley. Um, so the inclusion criteria for our study included AIS patients who had undergone PSF or PSF with thoracoplasty aged uh, 10 to 22, sorry, that should be 10 to 22 years. Um, and then they had, uh, we, we measured pre and post operative percentage predicted pulmonary function test values, not absolute values. I'll come back to this later. Um, we needed a minimal two year follow up and uh, minimum report statistics. And uh, we defined thoracoplasty as the partial or complete resection of at least one or more ribs. Exclusion criteria was any non idiopathic uh, or early onset uh, scoliosis. Any patient that had undergone conversion to PSF or PSF plus TP from growing, any growing rod construct, including uh, the newer Magic and uh, Schiller. Uh, any patient who had staged surgery uh, and with later reports, and then any literature reviews and abstracts and, and technique reports and case reports were excluded. Our search strategy included the usual uh, databases, Embase, PubMed, EBSCO host with CINAHL and Medline. And to include some gray literature, we trolled Open Gray. Uh, there was no limit on our uh, dates that we set. So it's up to March 2021. Unfortunately, we could only look at papers in English. Uh, we did not have access to reliable translation services at the time. And we needed uh, proper sample size mean and standard deviations reported. The variables, variables we collected were pre and post operative percent predicted forced vital capacity measurements. Again, that percent predicted forced expiratory volume in one second. Uh, these were chosen because they, were, they are traditionally uh, the lung function parameters that are widely reported. We looked at Cobb angle, kyphosis angle, curve type, and length of follow up. Uh, if there was any missing data uh, encountered in any study, Authors were contacted via various means. 
uh, if we did not get a response in time, uh, the, the study had unfortunately had to be excluded. And we decided to group them uh, PSF versus PSF plus TP as our groups. Uh, our statistical analysis was also quite interesting. I'll get uh, back to this later. Uh, we looked at the mean change course between the pre and post-op uh, results uh, of the PFTs. We performed the pool random effects meta-analysis uh, in the 95% confident, uh, confidence interval. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of papers had missing standard deviations of the mean change cores. In, in fact, this was the most common uh, finding that we saw, and this needed imputation of correlation coefficient, uh, correlation coefficients to then um, impute new standard deviations. We then used different correlation coefficients uh, uh, to do a sensitivity analysis to make sure that our results remain robust. Um, we started out with about 7,000 uh, papers identified and whittled this down to about 100 full text articles um, and then eventually included 15 studies for quantitative synthesis and meta-analysis. Results from our initial variables, uh, uh, mean scoliosis, uh, Cobb angle ranged from 50 to approximately 68 degrees. Thoracic, uh, mean thoracic kyphosis ranges from 14 to 35 degrees. Uh, the majority of the studies included thoracic and thoracolumbar curves. There was nine thoracic only curves in four studies and all different types uh, of curves in two studies. Nine studies at a minimum follow-up of two years and uh, only six studies at a minimal follow-up of five years. So our initial results, uh, so this is percent predicted forced vital capacity change in the PSF only group. Uh, this included 11 studies with 639 patients. Um, and there was no significant difference uh, between the pre and post operative uh, percent predicted forced vital capacity. Uh, the heterogeneity was uh, moderate at 48% and the mean change score was 0.34. The next was our forced uh, uh, extraordinary volume in one second percent predicted in the PSF only group. This included 13 studies with the highest number of 920 patients. This actually showed a significant improvement uh, in the FEV1 uh, over these 120 patients. Um, but it has to be noted that it was quite a high heterogeneity found between these studies at 90 or almost 92%. So this should be uh, interpreted within this context. Uh, percent FBC in the PSF anthoracoplasty group included six studies, but there were different groups in some of the studies. So this is actually eight groups and six studies with 229 patients. As you can see, it's obviously a lot less of this performed these days. We did find a significant deterioration in forced vital capacity in this group. Uh, but although there was also quite a significant amount of heterogeneity in the findings between the studies at 75%. The mean change score was a 3.96. Uh, uh, or minus 3.96%. And then finally, the FEV1 in the PSF and uh, thoracoplasty group, again, six studies, eight groups, 229 patients, showed no significant difference between the pre and post-operative FEV1 with a mean change score of minus 1.48. Again, quite some high heterogeneity between the uh, studies there at 83%. Um, when looking at previous studies or previous SR and meta-analysis on this topic, uh, well, around this topic, first to perform here recently was Lee et al. in 2016. Um, and they found that thoracoplasty with any surgical approach uh, caused a, uh, an initial decrease in absolute pulmonary function test values, but this eventually, uh, it, within the first few months after surgery, but this then uh, normalized at two years. And in their PSF only uh, uh, category, they found an improvement in absolute PFTs at two and six years. Then again, Cato et al., performed uh, in his uh, systematic review and meta-analysis in 2019, which was actually published in uh, Globe Spine Journal. And they did not uh, find any significant improvement in FVC, a percent predicted FVC and FEV1 with a minimum of two years post-operatively after PSF only in mild to moderate AIS patients. The limitations of our study, obviously, uh, there were not a lot of uh, uh, studies. I think there were about two that uh, were only more than 10 years. The longest one was a Pearson study uh, from Sweden, which had a 25 year follow up. Uh, there were a lot of factors that could not be controlled for. This included the type of instrumentation, 
used and the thoracoplasty techniques and uh, the location of the thoracoplasty, whether it was upper thoracic, uh, mid or lower thoracic. Uh, we could not account for any physical therapy regimes and fitness levels of patients pre and uh, uh, post surgery. And also we could not account for smoking habits of patients. Um, there was also uh, the debate around the varying effects of scoliosis cob angle and the thoracic, uh, thoracic kyphosis angle on PFTs. And as we do know that this is quite a complex matter uh, involving a lot of factors, including intercostal muscle strength function uh, and uh, et cetera. Um, and again, imputation was needed for us to perform the meta-analysis, although this uh, strictly speaking um, was also uh, then tested with sensitivity analysis and found to be robust. Um, our results did not vary with sensitivity analysis. Um, I can go into greater detail about uh, correlation coefficients if, some, if anyone has any um, uh, questions for me. Um, there was a wide range of correlation coefficients used in our um, result interpretation and our results were robust. Uh, we actually eliminated a lot of studies due to database overlap, which is also another interesting point that we can uh, address in the discussion. And uh, we also took uh, percent predictors pul pulmonary function test values and not absolute pulmonary function test values. There's a lot of debate around this, and this can be addressed in the discussion as well. But we found that due to um, the the dynamic changes in pulmonary function test value as we age, a percent predicted a value that is correlated to a, a normal population is more reliable. So final thoughts, uh, things that we found interesting, um, are all thoracoplasty techniques created equal? It has to be noted that four out of the six studies, this is Akazawa at L in 2021, Durai at L in 2019, Greg et al. in 2011 and Shunguan et al. in 2011 did not find a significant deterioration in their percent predicted PFTs. This is FEC and FEV1. Um, and even Akazawa found an improvement in their pulmonary function test values. Um, something that we did find was actually quite prominent was overlapping databases. One can look at the literature out there and it might seem that there is a myriad of uh, proof, but one, once you go looking a uh, bit deeper, you would notice that the databases of a lot of hospitals are shared, especially um, in North America. We found this uh, and uh, your, your database footprint might, or your evidence footprint might not be as wide as you initially thought. And uh, statistics, devils in the details, unfortunately, um, uh, the imputation that was needed, uh, and we noticed that most of the papers did not published their standard deviation for change scores. And this uh, is actually a problem uh, in a lot of literature. And uh, what we found even when you're looking at um, uh, other meta-analysis in, in the Cochrane reviews, and we, uh, we really appreciate and request authors, if they can look at this, spread the word, please publish standard deviation in your change scores. And just as a summary, uh, so, Significant findings were a significant deterioration of force vital capacity when PSA was performed with thracoplasty, a significant improvement in FEV1 in the PSF only group, and then no significant difference in uh, the PSF group for percent predicted FVC and uh, percent predicted FEV1 in the PSF plus TP group. Thank you very much. Henry, applause. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Dekutowski also really applauds uh, the granularity and data reduction uh, that's so meaningful. Uh, first uh, point, um, without a question, um, the lack of standard deviation publication is a big deal. As a co-editor in chief of uh, Global Spine Journal, this is something we routinely send back to authors. I can only echo that. This is, uh, again, uh, your uh, great uh, analysis, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, please publish your standard deviations uh, and your means and just to put that out there. We need the data, and um, uh, this helps uh, later uh, data anal analytics so much. Now, my key first question is, um, if, uh, if I don't have a million pulmonary function labs immediately available, we do here, but if I wanted to do the simplest, most meaningful test to assess thoracic volumes, breathing volumes uh, on patients, is a simple incentive spirometry 
sufficient as a basic data gathering tool to see if a patient uh, can perform an adequate oxygenation, maybe paired with an oxygen or pulse oximetry. What, what's the simplest way, in other words, to measure pulmonary function as a routine tool in our post-operative patients with major deformities, such as we showed earlier today? I think, yes, that would be acceptable. I mean, you, you have your bedside uh, in, um, instead of spirometry available. And especially if you, um, you know, you standardize this, you use uh, everything, everything can be useful when it is standardized. If it's the same patient, same incentive of spirometer, same techniques, you make sure that your patient understands the proper technique of usage, uh, make sure that, um, that whether, if there was a bronchodilator uh, used in, in, in when using this, that it is documented. And again, for your own records, this is all something that is useful. I do, I would not discredit it at all. There are even, um, like I said earlier in the, in when we had the discussion, one of the case points, there are new, uh, findings coming out from, from various, uh, authors about inspiratory pressures and they, uh, inspiratory pressures being quite helpful in terms of uh, an indication for, um, obviously restrictive lung disease. Um, and you can now even have bedside, um, inspiratory pressure uh, meters available. I think this is actually, um, something that has to be looked at again in the, in the research in the future as well. And we will look at this in the, in, in Dublin. And, but yes, simplest, would be fine. Obviously, um, again, the older the patient, early onset scoliosis or early onset idiopathic patients find it quite difficult to understand um, pulmonary function testing, just the techniques around it. So probably more reliable in an older patient uh, if you can go for formal testing. Um, but again, uh, and again, also perioperative testing um, might not be that useful just due to the myriad of uh, other factors involved, uh, pleural effusions, um, patient uh, not being able to, to, to properly do the uh, spirometry due to pain. So um, spacing out uh, just proper protocols and as the protocols are followed, I think all the data will be useful. So uh, one uh, summary point I wanted to just emphasize again and get your uh, take on that. Thoracoplasty has a clear plastic uh, surgery role and is valuable and important uh, for patients. But beyond that, it does not affect long-term pulmonary function either positively or adversely. Is that a fair summary statement? I would say not entire. I would say a fair summary statement would be um, it, it may, there, like I said, our findings in the in, with forced vital capacity showed that it did actually cause a negative, a significant negative deterioration of four percent. But uh, there was high heterogeneity within those studies, and this is because I mentioned those four studies. Uh, most recently, Akazawa et al. Uh, from Japan in 2021 actually found an improvement. So you have, I think, if you have a patient that you are worried about at all, an asthmatic. A teenage smoker, I would not, I would not recommend it, um, which, which uh, unfortunately is is quite common in, in other parts of our world. Teenage smokers, uh, you know, pre uh, pre sixteen year olds. But anyway, um, but again, even even in patients who are, let's say, you know, athletes as such, I would not, I would not, I would not advocate for thoracoplasty due to, to the possible. Um, a negative effect on force vital capacity. The verdict is set out on expiratory volume in one second. So that would be an indication of, you know, obstructive disease. Again, um, that we didn't find any significant deterioration, but it was high heterogeneity. Um, yeah, I, I would I would actually say I would I would not advocate for thracoplasty if, if it can be avoided at all because of the risk of uh, restrictive lung disease of, or restrictive lung impairment of. So greetings uh, and uh, thank you for joining us, uh, all of you. Tarek Sohail from Pakistan and Dr. Shomo. Um, Patrick, may I ask you for final summary comments and statements on this work that you've mentored? I'd um, like to congratulate Henry on, on a very, very well-written thesis and very succinct presentation. Uh, I, I, just to echo, I would say we still have concerns about imposing thoracoplasty uh, on an individual who may be compromised. So it, it does have to be taken in an individualized context. Um, and I think we're only now starting to realize that a lot of the 
uh, impact of deformity um, on the respiratory side relates to the rotational um, component and the, the hypokyphosis that is occurring. So I, I think the situation is a little more complicated than just simply thoracoplasty, yes or no. Um, but I, I, I would think that there are some subtle findings in Henry's work, which should make us think again about doing thoracoplasty because um, while it may not be always outwardly or obviously negative, it can be, it can reduce um, your potential. And that may be an important reduction if someone is more marginal than already prior to surgery. So to be continued, really enjoyed this. We have to come to a close here in tight programming. Henry, congratulations. Echo what Patrick said. Patrick, so great to see you and your clinical insights. And uh, we will have the Kylie plasty now, uh, in addition to the thoracoplasty, to have additional rib anchoring. So uh, really good to see you guys. And uh, thank you for this collaborative ever, which uh, crisscrossed around the globe. Stay healthy, everybody. And till the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. Thank you all. What do you think?